Welcome to church. So we're starting a brand new series today. It's called 24. It's the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. It's an intense period. And uh, we're doing this series because it's so important. But when we look at it on the face of things, we can be a little bit distressed. Uh, it looks like Jesus is going down. It, things are happening that should not be happening. He's getting spat on. He's getting rejected. Uh, he's, he, it just doesn't seem to be going to plan. But the Bible presents a totally different picture. It suggests that even though all this is happening, God is totally in control and that he's actually wanting these things to happen. So it's a bit of a chaotic period and it's an intense series, but it's something we want to go through, we want to look at as we lead up to Easter. It's such an important time. Now, usually in my sermons, I'd have a few funny bits around about now, uh, but this content is intense, isn't it? I remember uh, several years ago, this movie came out called The Passion of the Christ, and, and I felt like I needed to go and see this as a Christian. I didn't normally pay for Christian movies at cinemas because they're normally rubbish, but uh, <laughs> the good news is they've been getting a lot better in the last 10 years, praise God. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, but this particular one, I knew I had to go, and so I went to the cinema by myself, I paid for my ticket, and I watched this movie, and it was awful. I, it was like watching my best friend get tortured. Uh, and sitting through that was an ordeal. Uh, it was intense. Uh, I was thinking, this guy's my hero, he's my friend, he's my lord, he's my saviour, and, and ugh, I don't really want to see that. I didn't really want to experience that. I've only ever seen that movie once. So I, I can't understand, oh yeah, I'll watch that one again. You know, No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so why, why would we do this now in, uh, in church? Why would we take several weeks to go through this together? Because when someone is at that pinch point of their life, when all the pressure's on, when they're in the crucible, that's when we see who they really are, isn't it? That's when it, it all comes to the surface, or who a person really is, what they're really like. And the good news is that although this is a difficult uh, topic and a difficult passage to wrestle with, when we see Jesus in this 24 hours, we see who he really is. And who he really is, is fundamentally impressive. And we will, at a whole other level, fall to our knees and worship him if we come to understand what he is like, what he is doing, how he's handling this 24 hours of his life. This 24 hours is the key that unlocks the whole of history. It's like everything comes together at this point. History, light, dark, pain, victory, power, everything. And an interesting thing is that this 24 hours is about you and me as well. Although it's all happening to Jesus, and, and he's the protagonist in the event, he's constantly calling us to deal with this day that we have a part to play, and we've got to look in what it means for us. Uh, we have in the Bible what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They record uh, Jesus' life, but the particular sections that deal with this last 24 hours of his life are called the Passion. And uh, they describe this, this intense period where the culmination of all his ministry came to bear. Now, that word passions changed meanings a bit over the years. We use it like, I have a passion for tennis, don't we? Or uh, something that we're into. But that word is a Latin word, and it means suffer. I can understand how it's changed meaning, because something we're most passionate about is something we're willing to suffer for, isn't it? Uh, but this is this original meaning of this word. The passion of Jesus is the suffering of Jesus. This season where he struggled, uh, but he got there in the end. And this is where the confusion lies. He's supposed to be the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The dude can just say things and the, the wind and the waves obey him. He can heal people. He can cast out demons. So how is it that we find him... Uh, being mistreated in law courts, being lied about, being spat on, being tortured, and being killed. How is that God's plan? It's, it's a big question, and it's one we want to wrestle with over the next few weeks. So Jesus, though, uh, the good news is, when he goes through all this, he's in total control. It's awesome to watch him. He's deliberate, he's focused, he's ready. See, he had this task set out before him, and he knew about it from the beginning of time. And over this series, we're going to see God's power in action uh, as he goes all the way to the cross. But let's go back before we go forward. 
we're going to go back in history to the time of David, king. God's people had always interpreted God's blessing physically. So when God said, I'm going to make you my people, and you're going to be blessed, and you're going to reveal my plan to the world, and all that sort of thing, they always interpreted that physically. And at the time of David was when it looked like everything God had said was coming true. David was the king, they were very prosperous, they had a lot of land, they were eating, drinking, and being merry, they had money, it was all good. And one of their poets sat down and said, I'm going to write a a poem about how awesome things are right now. He did an acrostic poem, I don't know if it was a primary school activity, I mean elementary, I've got to say here, elementary school. Uh, Don't you hate acrostic poems? Good news is it's translated into English, we can't tell it's an acrostic poem. Uh, Anyway, this song, Psalm 111, was a bit like uh, on the top 40, a hip-hop hit or a dance track or a party anthem, whatever you put on when it's a festival or a party and you're like, I want to I feel good, I'm going to put on my feel-good tune, this was it. They would roll it out every time there was a party. It wasn't for one specific feast or festival, it was just like their number one go-to. They loved this song and they would play it and sing it and cheer it and this is what it was. It says... Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name." The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. So when this was written, this was relevant. This was like an awesome season for the people. And uh, every time this song came on, it was like, woo, and they would sing it out with joy. However, history happened, didn't it? The Roman Empire came in and put its foot on the neck of Israel. They became an oppressed people. Now, in, in America, when we look around, we, we can't understand this. We, we haven't suffered year in, year out oppression. We don't know what it's like to have uh, some other nation's foot on our neck for years and years. But this song, which was once the top 40 hit, which was once this, this great tune that made everyone happy, it became a blues track. All right? It became an anthem of an oppressed people. They sang it no longer in celebration, but they sang it in longing, saying, God, come on, take us back to the good times. Get rid of this Roman occupation. Why can't we be free again? Why can't we be our own people again? Why can't we have a king on the throne in Jerusalem again? Come on. And they would sing this song a little bit like a dirge, a little bit like pain. Then comes along Zechariah. He was a priest in the temple at the time of Jesus' birth. He had a very unique experience. He'd been singing this blues song for many, many years. He knew it back to front. He was always hoping that God would finally turn up. And God spoke to him and said, you will see the Messiah in your lifetime. Wow, maybe the blues track is going to switch into a Tiesto Electronica dance beats again, right? I don't know. Uh, And he was excited. He was excited. And then one day, in comes Jesus, this child, and he holds this child, and God speaks to him, and he says, here he is. This is my Messiah. This is the one you guys have been hoping for and waiting for. And what does Zechariah do? In chapter 1 of Luke, it records, the very first words from his lips are a quote from Psalm 111. He goes back to this song. It's like, maybe it's not going to be a blues track anymore. It's going to be back on the hit parade. It's going to be number one again. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. 
And he quotes about four or five other Old Testament texts as well. But number one is Psalm 111, because he's excited. He's excited. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Ariana Grande held number one, two, and three in the top 40 recently. And the last time that happened was the Beatles. How far we have fallen. <laughs> right? As a society. But... Zachariah, Zachariah is pumped. He's pumped because he believes that his song is no longer going to be a blues track. It's coming back. It's going to be sung by people who are no longer oppressed. It's going to be sung by people who are truly free again. Uh, and it's going to be like the times of David, the glory days, whatever the glory days were. Despite the teaching of the Old Testament, despite the teaching of Jesus, this was the prevailing idea. And even when Jesus turned up, he seemed to be playing to that tune, didn't he? He did all these powerful things. He did all these wonderful things. And, and he kept on giving people the confidence that, man, maybe he's the one. Maybe he is going to get rid of the Romans and deliver us back to being this free kingdom again. And on Palm Sunday, we saw a perfect picture of this. Jesus rides into Jerusalem and they all come out and they're like, Woo, it's happening. It's going down. We don't know how it's going to da go down, but it is going down. The Romans are being kicked out and we're going to have this awesome earthly kingdom again and we're going to be back on top. But Jesus had come for something far greater, hadn't he? Like He didn't just want to be the king of Jerusalem at that little period of time. He wanted to install a spiritual, eternal kingdom. He wants to be on a throne that will never be shaken ever again. And his plans are so much greater and so much bigger that we at this time couldn't understand them and we couldn't see them. He tried to tell us. He made it so plain at multiple times to the disciples, but they didn't get it. Look, look at this funny verse in Mark 9. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And look at the disciples' response. Didn't understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask about it. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Now, you're walking along, and you think this guy's going to be the next king. He's going to kick out Rome. He's going to be the big guy on campus. He can make waves stop. He can heal people. He can feed people. He can do whatever he wants. And then he says, yeah, I'm going to get handed over, and I'm going to get killed, and then I'm going to rise again. And they're like, you, you ask him. <laughs> what? Like, no one can look to history for a strategy like that, can they? Oh, yeah, that's just like that other guy who died in order to save everyone. <laughs> like, there's no, it doesn't make any sense. And it didn't make sense to them. So the best Jesus could do, the best he could do is teach them as much as he could so that post-resurrection, it would all fall into place and it would all make sense because they had no way of comprehending that he was going to do this. And isn't it amazing that when Jesus is about to face the worst, worst day ever, he's about to go through all this difficulty and this suffering, his mindset is still for us. He's still trying to explain the situation to us. He's still trying to set us up for success. He's still trying to uh, deliver for our sake. It's amazing. So let's look at this passage and see what's going on. We're going to have the Passover feast is the beginning of the 24 hours. Jesus has gathered his uh, closest friends. They're about to celebrate the Passover. The day is beginning. Uh, the worst day and the best day in the history of the world is about to start. And talk about missing the point. The disciples are still on this physical, earthly kingdom realm, and literally they're going to have uh, the Passover together. In a few minutes, we'll talk about this. The Passover is about a meal where they remember something being sacrificed for the sake of others, and Jesus is going to be telling them, this is me, but what are they thinking about? They're thinking about, man, soon Jesus is going to take over. He's going to be on the throne, and we're his best friends. <laughs> and they're literally imagining, who does this? When you've got something good coming up, it's going to be around the corner. You start 
like fantasizing and imagining about how good it's going to be. And you start thinking, oh, what's going to be like? Maybe it's a, a vacation or something. You're like, oh, it's going to be like this. We could do this. We could do that. We could do the other. The disciples are literally in front of Jesus having a discussion saying, who do you think is going to be the greatest? Who do you think is going to be at Jesus' right hand? John's like, I'm the beloved. I'm pretty sure I've got it. Peter keeps making mistakes. He's tripped up a bunch of times. I reckon I'm it. <laughs> Thomas is there going, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure. Am I, you know, uh, they're, all, they're all unsure. What's going on, right? And Jesus must be, if it was me, I'd be so frustrated. But Jesus is like, okay, I've got to get these guys in the right frame of mind. This happens to us parents all the time. The other night at uh, Chateau Mahag, we decided we were going to have a... We were going to have a little Bible study, and my wife got all the, the gear out. She got all the Bibles out for the kids, and I'm coming down the stairs, and what do I hear? My beautiful children, they're fighting. They're like, I had it first. Give it to me. And I'm like, oh, what are they fighting over? You know, I come down. They're fighting over Bibles. <laughs> it's like, my son wanted that Bible, and I don't want the purple one, and I don't like that one. My, one of my kids even said, I don't like that translation. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know. They're a work in progress. God is good. But, but the point is, you know, how ironic. These kids are fighting over the Bible. And same here. Jesus comes on this, this intense day where he's literally kicking off the end game of his whole ministry, this intense period of time. And here's the disciples missing the point so drastically that they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. So Jesus decides to teach them something very profound. John chapter 13, 3 to 5, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. They'd come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took, out his outer, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So Jesus knows this is the intense day. It's kicking off. His disciples are missing the point and he's got to get them on the right page. And the way he decides to do this is through a fundamentally awkward moment. They're in the middle of a meal, and I said yesterday he got his kid off, and I found out in America no one says that. Uh, he took off his clothes, right? He took off his clothes. It's so awkward. It's so weird. And the disciples are like, bro, what are you doing? Right? <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. And they don't like it. And the reason they don't like it is because we want our heroes to be heroes, don't we? We want our heroes to be cool and to look good and to be better than us. We want to be able to admire them. And Jesus is going to bust this mold. They want this king. And he goes, oh, this is what you're going to get. And he humiliates himself and starts to behave like a servant in front of them. And they're totally confused. He comes to Simon Peter, the passage continues, and he says, Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And why is Peter like this? It's because, you know, you can feel the tension inside his, his language. If you do this, I'm better than you. How can I respect you if you act like this? You're breaking the rules. Heroes are heroes, servants are servants. Heroes can't be servants. It doesn't work. But Peter really loves Jesus. Jesus answers him and he says, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter says, Not just my hands, but my feet and my head as well. Jesus answers, Okay, those who have a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. So this is an awkward moment. The disciples are very confused. They're talking about who's going to be the greatest in this new kingdom. Psalm 111 is going back onto the hit parade. We're going to be in charge again. We're going to be free again. We're going to have power again. All these good things. And the one guy that they're banking on to pull all this off gets his kid off, acts like a servant, and starts washing their feet and freaks them out. The passage continues. You call me teacher and Lord, Jesus says. You want me to be teacher and Lord. And then he says, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also shall wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. So, intense moment. Jesus says, all right, I'm not going to be a king like you think I'm going to be a king. 
And if you want me to be your teacher and Lord, then you've got to do what I do. And I'm going to serve. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to love people. I'm going to put other people first. I'm going to humiliate myself for their sake. And he does this, and, and, and it's a great little lesson. But if we think that this Bible passage is about that, we've actually missed the point. Yes, Jesus is giving a great example of his humility. Yes, Jesus is showing us that we should put others first. Yes, he's showing us what servant leadership is truly like. But that is not what this passage is about. I'm going to go all the way back to the start of the passage. I'm going to re-emphasize some bits, and I'm going to put some bits back in that I snuck out. For those of you looking at the references, you might have noticed I cut and pasted a little there. Uh, I'll put the whole passage in this time. Let's see what's really going on. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. Why does John open it with this statement? He says the 24 hours, the last day of Jesus' life, is about to begin. He says this is an intense period. He came from God and he knew he's returning to God. The end game has begun. This is a very intense moment. This is not a little life lesson on how to be nice to people and put other people first. This is full on. Passage continues, so he gets up from the meal and, and he takes off his outer garments and he begins to wash their feet. This is a picture he's about to paint of the cross. He's saying to these guys, I'm going to be stripped naked. I am going to be humiliated. I am going to be humbled and it's for your sake. Look at the passage as it continues. He comes to Simon Peter, who says to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. This is, a, this is a picture. This is not about cleaning feet. This is not a little object lesson on how to be nice and put other people first. He says, hey, you, you're not going to understand what I'm doing until I die and rise again. I've told you plainly that I have to die and rise again, and you don't even get it, and you've just put it out of your mind. And you're still operating on this wavelength that I'm going to come and become the next king in Jerusalem, kick out the Romans, and we're all going to have a party and sing Psalm 111. That's not how it's going to go. If you don't understand, Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus' response is intense, isn't it? He says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. What? I just didn't want you to touch my foot because it's got a corn on it. Right? <laughs> it's not about the feet. It's not about the washing. What's he, what's he explaining here? He literally says to Peter, if I don't wash your feet, mate, you have no part with me. This, this symbolic activity, this thing he's doing, is telling them about what's going to happen on the cross. Then Simon says to him, not just my hands, but my feet, my head, everything as well. He says, if you've had a bath, you only need to wash your feet. Your whole body is clean. And here's the next confusing thing. He says, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew, that he was going to, uh, he knew who was going to betray him. And that, that's why he said not everyone's clean. So even more confusing now, he's washed everyone's feet now. He says to Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you're not clean and you have nothing to do with me. And then he says, even though I've washed everyone's feet, one of you is not clean and is not ever going to be clean. What is going on? This is an intense passage. And the disciples didn't understand it. Because when Jesus the next day goes to the cross, what do they do? They scatter and they flee. They didn't get it. They still thought he was going to be this king who would start a physical kingdom and overthrow the Romans and be in charge. And when he got killed, they, they were lost. They were destroyed and they fled and they scattered. Then three days later, he rises again and does something that no one has ever done in history and overcomes death and turns back up and shows them that this was the plan all along. And then there's this dramatic transformation in the disciples. All of a sudden they realize, oh my goodness, at the cross, Jesus washes the universe's feet. He washes everyone's feet. He gives everyone on earth the capacity to be clean, if only they would receive it. 
And for anyone who rejects that, they reject it and they don't receive it. But for those who want it, they will be clean because of what Jesus has done. Look at the end of the passage now. It takes on a whole new weight. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put his clothes on and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? No, they didn't. We know that. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Now, when you read the book of Acts, which came after the resurrection of Jesus, did the disciples go around washing everyone's feet? No. No. Because it wasn't about washing feet. Otherwise, every time we'd read a new passage, it would say things like, and then Paul went into Iconium and he washed a bunch of people's feet there. And then he went over to Athens and he washed a whole bunch of people's feet there. No, that didn't happen. And thank God, we don't have to wash feet, right? Uh, I know some weird Christians like to get together and do the feet washing thing. You don't have to do that. Don't do that. Uh, That's gross. (laughs) What is it about? Well, see, post-resurrection... The disciples got it, right? While Jesus was dead, they scattered and fleed. But when he resurrected and they understood, they realized, oh my goodness, we now will follow our Lord and Master. No servant is greater than Master. We now will do exactly what Jesus has just done. We now will give our lives for the sake of washing people's feet. And they took the gospel message the message that proclaimed to the world, God has washed your feet if only you would receive it. They took that message far and wide, didn't they? And it cost them their lives. Each one of the disciples was martyred. They were killed as they shared their faith. But they did so because they finally understood what Jesus was trying to teach them on this amazing, profound night where he humbled himself and showed them what was about to happen for their sake. And post-resurrection, they looked back, and imagine John writing this and thinking, wow, what a king, what a Lord, what a saviour. He tried to show us. We didn't understand, but he knew we wouldn't, and he loves us anyway. And then, emboldened by the Holy Spirit, emboldened by all of this experience, emboldened by the resurrection of Jesus, John took the gospel as far as he could until his life was taken from him. It's an amazing passage of scripture. It's not just a little life lesson on servanthood. This is the picture of the whole point, the culmination of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now let's consider the actual Passover meal they were having again. God's plans are amazing. This 24 hours looks out of control, but it's totally organized. Totally organized. Just think about the Passover. Thousands of years earlier, God establishes a feast. He establishes an idea that ultimately doesn't make sense until Jesus comes along. Just think about it. If you don't know the history, you can read it in Exodus. But God's people are stuck and oppressed under Pharaoh. God sends plagues and a whole bunch of things to make Pharaoh let his people go so that he can begin his good plan to get toward Jesus. And, and Pharaoh's so stubborn that God has to do something terrible. He sends an angel of death that's going to kill the firstborn in every household. And then he tells his people to do something strange. He says, go and get this perfect lamb. Sacrifice the lamb. Take the blood and put it on your doorpost and I will pass over that house and save you from death in that house. Now, do you honestly think that God's angel of death needs a GPS or some special mark on a door to not know which houses to hit? Of course not. But why did God institute this thing? Because all through the scripture, God is trying to teach us and show us what has to happen so that we can come back to him. And Jesus literally sits with these guys on that night, and you can read it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he says to them, picks up the bread, and he literally says, this is my body. He says, guys, we've been celebrating this Passover for all these years, 
about a lamb that was slain in order for people not to die. It's me. Me. This is my body, broken for you. And he takes the wine, which represented that blood that would be marked on the doors that would save that household. He says, this is my blood. It's going to be poured out for you so that you can have the forgiveness of sins and that you can be restored into my family. This whole Passover meal was set up so Jesus could turn up and say, I'm going to die and rise again. It's not just a little display of power. It's me taking on your sin, taking on the sin of the world, cleansing you through my sacrifice. And God establishes this huge plan right through history to make sense of the cross. Many people were killed on crosses, but Jesus' death on the cross changed the world and history forever. And in order to make sense of that, he had to teach us. That's right. So the disciples were concerned about who was going to be the greatest. The disciples were thinking that some physical kingdom was going to be reinstalled. They're thinking that they might even be important in that new kingdom. And Jesus comes along and says, guys, it's so much bigger than this. I'm setting up a spiritual kingdom which will one day become a physical kingdom. I am going to be the king of kings. I am going to come in power the way you imagine, but it isn't going to be now. Because first, I have to save all of you so that you can come with me. What an intense, amazing moment in history. Before we move on from this, I want you to consider Peter and Judas. Peter and Judas both experienced Jesus. Peter and Judas both saw his power. Peter and Judas both were washed by Jesus. Jesus loved Peter and Judas. But Satan was chasing after both of them. Many scriptures talk about Satan pursuing Judas and Judas entertaining that. But Jesus also warned Peter, didn't he? He said, Satan's after you too. Look in Luke chapter 22. Simon, Simon, which was Peter's name before it got changed. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. So Satan wants to go after these disciples. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Isn't this amazing that the grace... And the love of Jesus is not dependent upon performance. That's why I sing. That's why I sing. He says to Peter, mate, you are going to sin. You are going to fail. We're always hard on Peter. Uh, One of the Gospels records that when he says, I'm not going to fall away from you, Jesus. I'm going to be with you even if they kill you. All the other disciples say the same thing as well, it says in the scripture. But we always pick on Peter. But he was the one that said it. I'm going to be there for you. And Jesus says to him here, buddy, Satan's after you, and you're going to fall, and you're going to stumble. But I'm praying for you. And when you come back, because he knew he was going to turn back, when you come back, strengthen your brothers. Be a leader. When you understand what I've done for you, when the Spirit comes in power, then you're going to be able to actually have some victory in your life. But till then, I love you. I love you and I've washed your feet. It's done. Isn't that awesome? And we have a choice today, guys, as we respond to the reality of this Passover feast, the reality of the last day of Jesus' life. It's what are we going to do? And Jesus says the same thing to you and me as he said to Peter. Unless you let me wash your feet, you will not be clean. Jesus went to the cross. He has washed the feet of every person ever born. But we need to receive that in order to experience that cleansing and that freedom and that forgiveness and to be ushered into that new kingdom, a kingdom way better than first century Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I don't want to live there. Uh, It's the best. It's the best. Second thing I want us to take from this sermon is just stand back in awe of the God who is in control. And we've picked on just the Passover today. So many threads run all through history and all through Scripture, established by God, so that people like me, who can't believe something until I have answers, can look 
and see the way he's orchestrated history and just say, wow, wow, you are a mighty God. You are in control. You are so powerful and you are so good. You are so good. And I hope that as we finish off this 24 series over the next few weeks, that you will just be blown away over and over and over again at the power of God to orchestrate history, to get done what he wants to get done. He is a good God. Would you stand with me? I want to read Psalm 111 again. It started off as an awesome dance track of celebration, a party anthem. It turned into a blues track. Sung because of pain, hopefulness, somehow God's going to get us back to the good old days. But now it speaks about something far greater than the good old days, doesn't it? Now it speaks about eternity and forever. And you look at this psalm, when these guys, it's almost like when inspired by God, they don't realize what they're writing. They were celebrating what God had done, but here we see what they were talking about is something far greater that's going to be going on forever and ever. I'm going to read it to you, enjoy it, and then we'll sing and respond in worship. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever, forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts, all his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen? Amen. We're going to have a, a team of people here, and I just encourage you, if uh, you want to be clean, all you need to do is start a relationship with Jesus because he did the heavy lifting on the cross for you already. Your behavior and your performance are irrelevant because he loved you and he has washed your feet. He's washed your feet. Come and receive Jesus. And the rest of us, let's worship and stand in awe of a God who is in total and utter control. Amen? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Help us to worship you wholeheartedly as we realize all you've done in our lives. Help us to follow you, Lord, to take that gospel, that good news of what you've achieved for all people on the cross and to spend our life giving that out to as many people as we can, letting them know that you have washed their feet if only they would receive it. Lord, we ask this in your awesome and holy and wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We really hope God spoke to you, but we don't want this conversation to end here. We want to continue this conversation with you throughout the week. That's why we have our online Facebook group, CCV Online Campus. You can join today, invite your friends to join, and we'll continue this conversation with you. I hope to connect with you really soon.